we're going to take a whirlwind tour through septic systems, and I wanted to start off saying they're not so bad. That's the message I want to leave you with. Uh, Massachusetts Alternative Septic System Test Center was actually started because we had a lot of vendors coming into our area saying, we got the best thing since, since sliced bread. That's possibly a bad metaphor. But uh, we've done a lot of research on alternatives, particularly nutrient removal systems, on alternative drain field products, removal of viruses, sand, or soils testing, alternate drain field products, the, res uh, the restoration of alternatives of drain fields. And so I want to do at least mention a few of the things that we are involved with. So I'd like to extend an invitation, by the way, to come to the alternative septic system. I'm not a tax lawyer, nor do I pretend to be, but you could probably write this trip off, get a little striper fishing in at the same time, and see some alternative technologies actually in the field. So what is the standard system, and how good is it? Today's standard system actually is a septic tank, a distribution box, and a bed of some sort. They either call it a leach field, soil treatment unit, or that area in your backyard where the grass grows real well. But I'd like to ask you a few questions first. Little test. Which of these two, you don't have to raise your hand, but which of these two is from right beneath a septic system? Just think about it in your mind. Now tell me, how far beneath this septic system do you think one of those is. How many would say 10 feet beneath it? Raise your hand. Nobody. Five feet beneath it. How about beneath it at all? Anybody? Okay. Two feet beneath it. That is what two feet of medium sand will do if loaded properly. And the message I want to leave with you today, if you think nothing else except my raspy voice, is when it comes to soil treatment, it's all about the loading. It's how you load it. It's the actual loading, not this theoretical, gee, I got a field of 600 feet and I give it 200 gallons, therefore I'm loading it, whatever that math works out to be. Because under gravity feed systems, I'm sorry, you've got a lot of seasonal homes around here. Gravity feed systems do not optimize what you could be getting out of your system. So, what is wastewater? Wastewater is basically the remnant of what we eat and soaps and everything else because God marvelously rearranges what we take into our bodies into that thing you look in the mirror every morning and you say, wow, this is good. Or if you're like me, you say, wow, what happened overnight? <laughs> but that's basically what it is. What it is not is nuclear waste, radioactive waste. It has to be treated properly, but it's not something that's so obnoxious that we can't treat it. it. Used to be the septic systems were thought as that temporary means by which we would get rid of wastewater until the sewer came. But we know, don't we? The sewer isn't gonna go everywhere. It just isn't gonna happen. So what we should be thinking about is how to turn the treatments, these disposal systems, into treatment. I listened to the New York and I read the uh, standard before I got here, how they discount or don't allow the use of certain things anymore, basically because they did what we did in Massachusetts. We worked out of our code those things which are just getting disposal and tried to work into those things which would actually affect treatment. So, how do traditional systems treat wastewater? Well, there's a number of means it can do it. Let's go with nitrogen first. For nitrogen in sandy soils, about 20 to 30% removal of nitrogen occurs in the soil. Now, I looked at some of your soil maps here and you got some pretty tight stuff. If you load that soil properly, you could probably tweak a lot more than 20 to 30% out of it. And all the literature would show you that that if loaded properly, tighter soils will remove more nitrogen. But what's the problem there? Does anybody see the problem? Problem is the systems would have to be bigger. We have to get used to using the soils and the soil profile a lot more efficiently than just dumping water into it and letting it go away. 
for phosphorus, the same thing. Tighter soils will allow for a lot better phosphorus removal if loaded properly. It also depends on what the fraction of fine material in your soils are. But if you want to remove phosphorus, we did, for instance, on Cape Cod, I took our sand, which is basically an iron-rich sand, and for about six months, it'll remove a lot of phosphorus. After that, it starts bleeding through. But if we just add 5% fine material to that, like a silt fraction, not clays, but silt, we can increase the time it will remove phosphorus, and it will get down below one milligram per liter. And now I've been running systems six, eight, 10 years, and they're still working. The thing with phosphorus is, you have to remember, it's a gift that keeps on giving. There is no phase in which you can get phosphorus out of a system except by adsorbing it, collecting it, hyperaccumulating and pumping it. With nitrogen, there's a gaseous phase. With phosgene, unless you're a terrorist making phosgene gas, you are not moving it out of the system with gas. Pathogens. The removal of, for pathogens in the standard system loaded properly is phenomenal. Sand, for instance, I noticed that New York went to four foot setback. In sand, at four foot setback, you probably get a four log removal, four to five log removal of pathogens. Great move, but you gotta think about something. Again, I come back to, if you're gravity feeding a system and you're seasonal and you're putting it in the sand fill, guess what? You're not using the bed while they're there for that season. Just not using it. Using about one third of it, and then the rest, you're hyperloading it so those pathogens, everything moves through. Phosphorus doesn't get a chance for removal. Nitrogen might be just about the same, but the idea is you can use what you have to achieve better treatment without going to excessive uh, alternative treatments. Improving the performance, you really have to know when you're thinking about alternative treatment. What is it you're actually looking for? Because I have nothing against alternative treatment. It's my bread and butter. So again, that's possibly a bad metaphor. But when you're looking to pay a lot of money for alternative treatment, you better make sure it's going to meet your target goal. A lot of systems out that you'll see in the market can remove nitrogen. But what if you don't have to remove nitrogen? I mean, in a pond, generally the limiting thing is phosphorus. In Lake George, it appears to be phosphorus. So, alternative technology, what is it? How much does it cost? We have looked at every technology out there, pretty much. Every major technology is tested at our test center. They all work the same way except one system, and I'll talk about that at the end. They basically, they basically manipulate a nitrogen cycle within a box, within a unit, to get the ammonia coming out of your septic tank to nitrify, then to denitrify, which means it goes up as nitrogen gas. And the nitrogen gas, four-fifths of what you're breathing right now is nitrogen gas. Isn't it a comforting thought that some of that would probably come from septic systems? <laughs> no, not really. Well, then God does a shipping around the earth. Really. This particular cycle right here, if you memorize that, you've got every alternative septic system except one memorized, how they work. And when you look at systems out there, you say, okay, where do you nitrify? Where do you denitrify? Because you cannot denitrify without nitrifying first. Unless, of course, you drop hydrogen peroxide in a septic tank, get it all off as ammonia, but then you've got a septic tank full of hazardous material. If you want to know how every one of these systems in our database works, there's a website there. You will go to that website, you would see something that looked like this. It's a chart that gives every alternative septic system on Cape Cod or by town or by technology. Anything you wanted to know and more and don't want to discuss at your next party, you could find those data there. They tell you how well they work. And what we conclude is that these systems work for nitrogen removal, 50% of your nitrogen removal, about 78% of the time. And this is if they're managed. 
because I got to tell you, I heard this thing this morning. I got to tell you about DRIP. And DRIP is a phenomenal system. Phenomenal. But if you don't manage it, you might as well not have it. You're going to have stuff on top of the ground. You're going to have brown trout on a property, and they ain't the kind you can eat. Okay, so what about phosphorus and orthophosphorus? Well, you got to know that that is definitely the gift that keeps on giving. There is no phase for it that gets it out of the system except physically removing it or something you don't want to do in Lake George, cap it in the sediments with alum or doing something really dumb like that. What you want to do is work at the sources. Presently, there are two systems in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts that are allowed for phosphorus removal. And you ought to understand that phosphorus chemistry, it's not as easy as nitrify, denitrify, nitrify, denitrify. That one's an easy one. You could probably get away with the crib sheet on your hand if you ever had to take that test. Try it with phosphorus chemistry. You better have two arms to write on because there's a lot that happens. And in particular, it's unique to the geology of the area, what you can remove in the soils that you have. First system is a phosphorid. They call it a passive system. All it really does is take, it works on a principle called reactive iron dissolution. You dump iron filings into a place where it's really anoxic, pump chamber right after a septic tank or in the septic tank itself. And what will happen is the iron will release its ions, which will bind with phosphorus and then float them out to either to a sacrificial filter or to the leach field itself. There are two presently in Massachusetts, they're both on Nantucket. They get very good phosphorus removal, but they're in piloting phase, which means we're not convinced they total work, totally work, and two, by any standards, is a small sample size. That's the phosphorus chemistry. Write it quick, put it on your arm. So this is actually how it would work, septic tank, reactive iron dissolution, and there's uh, the, finally it sends out the soluble iron into the leach field where it will precipitate. I'm sure there's some contractors now going, wait a minute, you're sending it out there to precipitate? Maybe we don't want that. Yeah, that will be a problem, and we don't know how long that leach field will last with that. However, what we do know is six years worth of doing it, we don't see the iron clogging the leach field. The other system is one that could be retrofit, and again, it's in, it's in the piloting phase. It's called the Waterloo ECP. This, you would go up to a standard septic tank. You drop a couple of big, big iron plates down into the septic tank hooked up to a small power source. The power source would run through the iron, would create the iron ions, and they would bind with the phosphorus and again go out to the leach field and form strungite and uh, vivinite and some of the other compounds that are formed with phosphorus. Now again, we've run leach fields with this for six, seven years now and not seen any clogging. But we don't know how long they will last because they're working on a complex chemistry which may in your area result in something you don't want to see. And if you don't want to see, you certainly don't want that phone call in the middle of the night. These are some of the data from that. They were published at a NOWER conference, and they look pretty darn impressive. And these were done at our facility. This test was done at our facility, which the vendor brings in their material. We test it, and we don't let them touch it until the test is done. So it's third-party testing. Okay, a word about advanced technologies. Again, they have their place. You got a tight situation, you don't have 40 acres to turn this bus around, you need a small leach field or you need to make it the standard size leach field, they have their place. But know your target, what you're doing, and look at your options, look at all your options and do your research on it. What does the system remove? What's its contaminant of target? And will it apply in our area? And the final thing is committing to pro proper oversight. I suspect the reason that DRIP is not allowed under your code 
is the same thing that was said from this pulpit. It was, we're afraid of freezing and maintenance. But, you know, and I won't speak for the regulators, I'll only speak for me, I'm a regulator and, you know, I understand at least the concerns of a regulator. If you were to propose a district that used a system like drip or a shallow drain field, and you put it under a responsible management entity, that is, somebody would go out and make sure that homeowner did, secure the money up front to make sure it got done, then why would you not sort of move in that direction? IA systems, uh, alternative sy septic systems, you better have a management plan. We do in our state, in, on Cape Cod, if you own, operate, maintain, or monitor a system, you have to report to us. If you don't do it in the, in the required time period, when we turn the computer on in the morning, we get a little red flag. And we call the owner and say, what happened? And they say, well, I didn't like the guy. I didn't like the cut of his jib. I threw him off the property. Oh, I'm sure you're going to get somebody else. We'll, list, we'll send you a list. No, that son of a bitch, I don't want him on my property. I say, fine, that's good. Here's a list. 99 times out of 100, they call the same son of a bitch back because it's just they didn't want to pay the guy. But now they know they're being watched. Now they know they're being regulated and there's $250 a day fine for noncompliance. That's something that wakes you up. But I'm sorry to say that if you put these in somebody's backyard, yeah, you should always be dangling carrots, but you better have the stick. Okay. So my uncle once said, yeah, it is my uncle. Everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. Optimizing soil absorption systems to remove target contaminants. Find out what it is you have to remove, then look at the soils data, look at the soils information out there, and see whether you have an opportunity to take a standard configuration, modify it a bit, and get out what you want. Sorry, I got a little raspy voice here. My wife would say I talk too much. She'd be right. Normally in our area, what we do because of the soils underneath are so good, we just keep digging to where we can get rid of it. Is that what they do around here? Do you dig till you can get rid of it? Why? Because up top, if you use those soils, you're gonna have a lower acceptance rate. You're gonna have a lower perk rate. You're gonna have to make the system bigger. And how many people have customers here which would say, give me a bigger system, raise your hand. Yeah, I didn't think so, because that means more money. But I'll tell you one thing, that means more treatment if you can use those upper soil layers. So we typically dig down to the sea layer, throw the good stuff away, fill it with sand, and let it fly. But when you do that, you limit the soil's ability to help you out. Now, I know what I know as a regulator, you look and you say, yeah, you're dreaming. You're dreaming because these guys won't design these systems right. There's a lot more finicky nature to soil. But in the long run, trying to introduce into your area, optimizing the standard septic system to get removal is going to help you. If you did nothing else, okay, I'm a bozo, I don't know nothing, do one thing. Start thinking about pressure distribution to your systems. You know in gravity system, for the first three months, if you're using a 30 year leach field, I'll drink what gets past it. Really, we have done s studies where we put observation ports all the way down that leach field. And if you come seasonally, that's it, you're using one third. So, so why the hell make the big system? Just give them one third. No, I don't propose that. I propose put in the full system and pressure dose it. You want to go one more, st one more thing? Time pressure dose it. Make a pump chamber in there so that every two hours, a little pump comes on and gives a small dose. More air will mean better phosphorus retention. More air will mean nitrification. More air will start killing your pathogens. More air will preserve your leach field. 
all of those things are the benefit of small, many doses over day. Oh, whoa, use too much power. No, you won't. 12 bucks a year. Start thinking about this. This is a one her third horsepower Myers pump. That's what we use. That thing is going to activate, say, 12 times a day and may, may run for two minutes during that period. So 12 times 24, give it the startup amperage, do everything you want. That might be, might be 1.5 kilowatt hours a day if the pump is really hard to turn on. That's nothing. I mean, compared to some of the alternative septic systems out there, five, six kilowatt hours a day, yeah, I'll buy that 1.5 any day. That's how I get a little passionate about pressure distribution. So shallow soils-based systems integrate wastewater disposal with wastewater treatment. So you want to get the best out of it? Use those upper layers. You'll get better nitrogen, phosphorus, pathogen, contaminants of emerging concern. You will get them. We've proved it. You can look at all our reports. They're all online. MASSTC.org. How many Catholics in the bunch? You should be able to remember mass. Then put TC on the end and put an org and you'll get it. Shallow soil space systems have a much better biology to treat your wastewater. If you look at it, here are your opportunities. You get adsorption. You get some plant uptake and maybe phytoremediation. We don't know quite on that. We know it's not just adsorption because we've run drip systems for years and not retrieved the contaminants of emerging concern under them beyond, I mean, the soils themselves, eluding the stuff off the soils. We actually get a reduction. There's some metabolism there because can we talk? There is a bug out there that will eat anything. Anything. Think about it. The most foul stuff coming out of our orifices here, and there's bugs that eat that. But, you know, every day, if you ever want to do something, set your cell phone up to look at microbiology, contaminants of emerging concern, uh, and wastewater. And if that thing, if you set that up on Google Alert and don't get two or three buzzes a week, if nothing else, you have a little fun, put it in your pocket. But but if you don't get those buzzers a couple times a week, I'd be surprised. Because what I found just before I came down here is that some Chinese guy in the mud in China, in the middle of China, dug up some mud and found that there was a bug that metabolizes at very low levels TSEP, trischloroethylene phosphate, a fire retardant you probably heard about earlier. And so how long is it going to take somebody to figure out how to take that little genome out, put it in an E. coli, which multiplies like crazy, and starts eating the crap out of T-cell? It won't be long. You feed anything. I'm going to ask a question here. Of these four people, five people, how many like anchovies on your pizza? OK, two. How many in the room? Raise your hand. Look at that percentage. The more diversity, the more you're going to get somebody who will eat those anchovies. The more diversity in the upper soil layers here, you are going to get more people, more bugs eating the anchovies. What are the anchovies? All the contaminants of emerging concern. So if we encourage the disposal into an area where there's high biological diversity, we will get more people eating the pizza. Okay, so this is what a drip system works. You saw the picture, but we put them in sand, we put them in native soils, whatever. But this is a study we did on pharmaceuticals and personal care products in sand because we figured if it does it in sand, you got a much better shot in finer soils because you got a lot more surface to volume ratio on those small soils, you got a lot more residence time, and you have a lot lower loading rate. That's what it looks like in the end, by the way. And who doesn't like a nice lawn? You probably have people dumping fertilizer on their lawns to get it to look like that. This could start a whole new paradigm. Your lawn looks crazy. It's brown as, and you say, honey, invite the kids. Invite all the neighbors. Second room to the left, flush twice. 
You come out the next day, your lawn's beautiful. And you're getting rid of the contaminant. Only kidding there, folks. I don't want to encourage that. Okay, shallow drain fields, same way. You get adsorption, you get the uptake by the plants, you get a lot of things that can happen in that very biologically active zone. Now, I heard the thing about freezing, and I agree. Incorrectly installed, these things will freeze. I just have never seen that, and you saw the jaboni putting in those drip systems? That was me. I'm not a contractor. I'm a fisheries biologist, for God's sakes. I don't know anything about that. All I know is how to read a level. So you put them in, they didn't freeze, and we ran them for four years to see whether they had removed viruses, pathogens, contaminants of emerging concern. So again, this is like one normal installation. It's what they do in Rhode Island, uh, shallow drain field. Uh, the absorption area is really only the 12 inches. They sort of treat it, that's where the, um, the interface is the only credit they get for loading. Another way to do it is shallow drain field is a product called uh, Geomat. We don't endorse it, but we've used it and it has the same thing. That's where we also found great removal of phosphorus if your soils were finer textured, great removal of pharmaceuticals, personal care products. And beneath this system, just 18 inches down, you know, you would find that nice clear water that, you know, it would maybe have some viruses in it. That's why I used to, by the way, pass around the bottles in these plastic bottles and say, this is from beneath the septic. I was always concerned somebody might be real thirsty and drink it, and so I was always looking at the news the next day for this new outbreak. <laughs> so I stopped doing that and just give you the pictures. Okay, this is what that system looks like going in. It's a low pressure distribution system. Those are one foot wide mat. They come in 30 inch, 39 inches wide or one foot. We use them and this is what it looks like afterwards. And I gotta tell you folks, that's what it looks like in the middle of January too. Uh, and that's the downside. You know, I, I, I'm an ecologist. I like to think about our carbon footprint. You know how many lawnmowers had to go over that thing? <laughs> yeah, so, but. Guess where the nitrogen's going there? Some of it. And besides, you know, you should know that the majority of nitrogen is bacteriologically sent up as nitrogen gas. But when you can look at, make it look as pretty as that, you know, you got a homeowner that might say, yeah, I like that lawn. Particularly, I don't, because I don't like cutting them. Okay, nitrogen. What we've done with nitrogen, same thing. We send that stuff to the groundwater, the nitrate enters into the environment, and in our marine settings, it's terrible. They go crazy. It starts algae growth. Algae growth is good. By the way, you should thank an algae today. 90% of what you're breathing right now for oxygen, oceanic algae. But when you put it in a closed environment, and you don't let it flush out, then what you're gonna have is the algae grow, and at night they're gonna suck the air out of the water, and then that's gonna kill fish, dogs, and cats living together. Hey, somebody get that joke. Okay, so what we're finding that to remove nitrogen, we may be able to go to a simple soil profile like this, and actually add carbon down below, encourage anoxic conditions, because that's what you need to denitrify and we looked for a carbon source, and it was right under our noses. It was wood. I mean, this is not new literature. This is stuff that, in fact, I was told, uh, Chris told me that one of the uh, treatment plants is gonna do some demo here using wood as a carbon source. Nice, low-release carbon source. Little high in BOD at the beginning, but, you know, it tails out near the end, and all it is is bugs that have nitrate, and they say, oh my God, I need carbon. I need carbon. And if they don't have any oxygen, and they have nitrate, and they have carbon, they'll denitrify. If they have too much oxygen, they'll say, hey, forget that, I'll use the oxygen. That's like having an electron acceptor at a, a nice low shelf instead of a high shelf. Okay, what we do is we present the, uh, beneath the system, we put a layer of the carbon, just like this, little silt and sand mix to slow it down, 
And these are results over that many days. How many days does that say? My eyes are off. 600 days or so? 550, it's run another 20 minutes. It's run another uh, 20 days since then. Okay, this is what it looks like. Denitrification layer, sand sawdust, nitrifying up on top of it. Lay the network out. Guess where the nitrogen is going? That's year one. That's year two. Don't want to cut it. Phosphorus, the gift that keeps on giving, you got to locate it in the shallow soil horizon. But you know with phosphorus, watch your surface inputs. That's what you do. A lot of surface inputs, stormwater, that stuff. Septic is big. I'll get it. That's my bread and butter. But a lot of that stuff comes in from the surface, composting too near shore, things like that. Cutting the grass right down, throw it in the water. All that's phosphorus. Even leaf fall is phosphorus. Okay, what about pharmaceuticals and care products? Are we concerned about them? Yes, because you can fool them to Mother Nature. We heard about this. You, these are all the forage fish that could be affected by that. One of those, anybody here Canadian? Oh, you're crazy, you know. They actually took one of their lakes, Karen Kidd, dumped enough little estrogen in it, estrogen mimicker from like birth control pills, shut down the whole fish population. And you know what that was? That was five to seven nanograms. Want to know what a nanogram is? Picture yourself driving down the road. You come up behind a, a tanker, 10,000 gallon tanker. You go to pass them, and there are 10 miles of those tankers all in a big convoy. By the time you get to the front of them, you've just passed. Five drops in that volume is five nanograms that shut down a fish population in a pond. Think about it. Or don't think about it, it's scary. But these are your most vulnerable in the food web, and you say big deal, or only minnows. But on the other hand, this is what they service. So, pharmaceuticals and personal care products removed by surface systems, much better than treatment plants right now. Probably due to the better residence time, probably do the better resonance time, absorption, some biological breakdown, all of those things. All we know is, compared to a standard treatment plant, they work. And I'd be remiss if I didn't say this last thing. You want to treat wastewater? Don't make so much of it. Uh, no, I'm not proposing issuing corks or anything like that, but composting toilets, the lowest apple on the tree. Again, perhaps a bad metaphor. But composting toilets are easy, but not accepted. But if you could get them accepted, we did a project in Falmouth. Here's what we found. 90% load reduction by using composting toilets. But again, you're going to need a management entity to go in there and take the compost out every couple of years, make sure the tea is managed. I know that tea is the stuff that percolates down through. You gotta manage that. About 150 gallons a year for a normal household. You won't get much compost out of them, by the way. Everybody thinks it's a big pile of crap in their basement, but it really isn't. You got about maybe two wheelbarrows full for a four bedroom house. Or some of you guys that talk a lot, maybe, you know, there'd be more. <laughs> I know my house would have about six wheelbarrows and I'd be doing the roses. But you'd have to haul that out of the watershed because you don't want to play the shell game with it. 90% load reduction on total nitrogen and phosphorus. Two types of systems we use. We did one on a lakeside home and the other on a two occupancy home. It works. Now, try to get people to accept it who don't think these are uh, outhouse in your house. Hard. But if you looked at them, we have them in some high-end houses. People don't care. They say, you know, after a year of this, I walked up to a guy who was totally pissed off that the Board of Health made him put it in. And I said, what do you think now? I mean, I was curious. I didn't identify myself as a Board of Health member. But, and he said, you know, everybody should do this. It isn't that bad. It isn't bad at all. So consider it. Consider giving incentives for that. There's urine diversion. I'm not a big fan, folks, saving your pee. But nitrogen and phosphorus and pee is your main inputs of phosphorus into your wastewater, 70%, 80%. Same with nitrogen. And basically, 
They just put that into a tank and then pump the tank every once in a while. I'm not a big fan, and it's a, it's a uh, urine diverting toilet that's used. You know, it's a half and half, and people have complained that it's a little difficult to use. I always say, if you're a guy, have a quarter pop out of the wall. Every time I hit that hole, I'll hit it every time. But, but you also have to consider your gray water because you know people pee in the shower. Anybody pee in the shower? Yeah, yeah, you'd lie about other things too. <laughs> let's face it folks, once a day, some guy is there, uh, to, let's see, get out and slip on the floor or, so you can't just discount it all. You can't call it a, a drop dead thing, you're gonna get that reduction. But you will, you might be able to, with urine tanks, recover some of that stuff. Okay, the bottom line is, everything goes into your system affects the ecology of that lake. You definitely want to think about limiting that and using your soils-based systems. Now, when you do that, I think you should consider putting together the package for the very regulators that are gonna say, no freaking way, putting together the package that says, here's how they would be managed, here's the the uh, instrument, the legal instrument by which we will make them manage, and here's what it will cost a homeowner. But if you do that, yeah, you can put advanced treatments all over the place, and again, I love them. But when you think of a seasonal community, you might think of optimizing what you have. Because if you just did that, you'd probably go a long way. You can always retrofit between a septic tank and a leach field that's pressure dosed, a treatment unit when you have to. But think about this, engage some soil scientists. There's nothing much between these areas, but you get soil scientists who could tell you exactly what will happen. Look at the literature, look at the science, look at what's being done on the Chesapeake, what's what be done on Lapine, Oregon. Look at all those pro projects that are out there that you can avail yourself to, publicly funded projects that would feed the information that you need to protect your area. And by the way, I love that lake. I, I, the only reason I came here is Chris said, hey, they named a lake after you, George. Hey, okay, I, I'm coming. <laughs>